I have an idea, honey, I said, embracing her and looking down into her excited blue eyes. Yes, she retorted playfully. What is your idea? I whispered the words, let's go to the sea tomorrow, again looking around to make sure the girls couldn't hear me. She smiled broadly, nodding her head, as if by that gesture it would all remain real, and it worked. The very next day, Nicole was waiting for us upon our arrival after nine hours on the road. Her warm welcome will remain among my most cherished memories. For two weeks, our family was in paradise, living in an apartment that overlooked the breaking waves of the KwaZulu-Natal south coast. We slept with tall glass doors flung open, the sea breeze cooling us in that hot March weather. Not a shadow passed over that idyllic vacation. Toward the end of that vacation, I again succumbed to a further temptation to treat my family. Not far from where we were staying was a stretch of coastline called the Wild Coast, situated in the Transkei. A stone's throw from the Transkei border, a well-known hotel and casino group has operated a facility for years. Apart from their golf course and their casino, one of their major attractions is their Wild Waves water park. They spend many millions of dollars importing high quality features from foreign destinations making it a water park unlike any I have ever encountered. So, one sunny morning, we paid our entrance fee and found ourselves surrounded by an array of enticing water rides. From one to the next, amid the screams of delighted children, we climbed and skied and splashed ourselves to our heart's content. Toward the end of the day, Charlene and I found ourselves floating in a double tube, face to face, on the lazy river. We bobbed upon the gentle swells, drifting slowly in the yellowing rays of the setting south coast sun. We talked from time to time, but for much of that meander, we kept catching each other's eye. We smiled at one another, but didn't look away. In a strange way, there was nothing left to say. She understood me, and I understood her. She was content. I was content. All of the happiness of nearly two decades of satisfying married life culminated in those wonderful moments. Yes, it was an outstanding treat to be enjoying that much desired holiday, yet our mutual contentment came from far more than that experience. It flowed from a lifestyle of contentment. In those moments, looking at my beautiful wife's blue eyes, I felt a sense of finality, something like the end of an engaging novel with a happy ending. We enjoyed the lazy river so much that at the conclusion of our journey, we turned and did it again, and then again. We were living in a state of goodbye. If either of us had died at that moment, there wouldn't have been words we would have wanted to squeeze out as the light faded from the other's eyes. Everything had been said, and said well, long before the time. Working as a paramedic during our first few years of marriage, I had been so impacted by the tragic loose ends fluttering around the deaths of loved ones. Young men and women, children, grandparents, fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters facing the sudden death of those they clung to in love. How many times did I hear sorrowing family members and friends lament that they had not even had the opportunity to say goodbye? How many sentiments had been left unspoken? How many of those people died shortly after an argument and had stormed out in a rage and had been killed on the road or in a drunken brawl? Loose ends, loose ends, loose ends. They galled me and drove me to my wife in love after long heartless shifts. I remember the day when I eventually sat down with Charlene and explained how sickened I was with these galling loose ends. 
I urged her to make a commitment to me that I too would make to her, that if either one of us died in a sudden unexpected way, we would leave no loose ends. We would leave nothing unsaid. We would have already said goodbye. We would each know that in the face of death, we would not be in a state of panic because there were things we still needed to explain to each other. We lived in a state of goodbye. Today, nine months after her death, I can't even begin to explain the value of living in a state of goodbye. With my left hand, I held her hand as I gripped the steering wheel with my right, racing through the night over a dirt road toward a distant hospital. Honey, I said as she gasped for air more and more rapidly, I'm so sorry you're struggling. She smiled. Then a little later, I squeezed her hand, my heart yearning to help her. I love you, honey. She smiled again. And even though she was in such distress, she smiled back, I love you too. Moments later, she arrested, dying with her hand in mine. In those horrible moments, there was no time or opportunity to say things that had been left unsaid, had there been any. Yet we had already said our goodbyes over the years that led up to her departure. As I brought the car to a halt to establish whether she was truly dead or not, I knew that I had nothing left to say. It had already been said. The moments after her death turned to minutes, hours, days, weeks, and months. Through the blackness of morning, it has been the fact that we lived in a state of goodbye that has brought me immense comfort. www.graceunlimited.co.za